we want to do is develop broader data sets that in particular can be used to spot what might end up being a regrettable substitute. So the regrettable substitute is a concept, say, in a consumer product when you're making it, where you kick out a known bad actor chemical that you definitely want to get rid of, but maybe you slip in its place something very similar that's just not so well studied. And it might turn out that replacement is actually just as toxic, so maybe you didn't fix the problem. So by going broad, we try to develop information that can help us avoid these regrettable substitutes and overall have a healthier environment. All right, we, as Tom mentioned, have done a lot of work on emerging contaminants in the Bay. And so we have many, many studies over a couple decades now on water, sediment, and biota in the Bay itself. And then we've also got great uh, collaborations with our municipal wastewater agencies, like the study presented previously, the PFAS study. But a few years ago, we realized we actually didn't know that much about urban stormwater. And this was maybe a data gap. Um, we have a lot of work in the RMP on PCBs and mercury in stormwater, but not so much on emerging contaminants. Is this a pathway relevant for that discharge to the bay? And we actually got an early hint that it was important through this interesting study, an exploratory study we did with Lee Ferguson at Duke University, where we used this technique called non-targeted analysis, which Tom actually mentioned earlier in the day. So for this study, we went out and we grabbed bay water samples from specific sites that had a strong influence of a particular type of pathway. And using this non-targeted method where we aren't looking at just a couple of contaminants, but we're trying to use kind of a fingerprinting method to see as many contaminants as we can identify. We ended up finding that the site with that stormwater influence was the most broadly contaminated site and had the kind of the highest signal of contaminants. So it really made us aware that this was an important data gap that we should be filling. So that was the motivation for a pretty big effort we took on um, over the past four wet seasons or the prior four wet seasons where we were collecting stormwater samples to evaluate occurrence and concentration ranges uh, of a variety of different emerging contaminants. We're trying to fill that data gap uh, for uh, knowledge of our bay. So here's a little summary information on the sites and the storms that were part of this study. So among our sites, we ended up hitting 21 different urban stormwater sites. Most of these we only hit one time during this four year period, but a couple we hit two or three times to try and get a sense of variability. Then we also included some reference sites, which were less urban in that upstream watershed, because we were curious to see if we could see a difference in the contaminant detections and concentration ranges. And overall, kind of a general sense of when we might mobilize a team to go out and collect a sample. Uh, in general, and this does get customized with the site and the knowledge of the watershed, but in general, we think about storms where the, the storm forecast is at least 1.3 centimeters of rainfall within six hours. So we want a good sized storm, like at least a, a medium storm that's gonna mobilize some contaminants into that watershed. All right, here are the five contaminant classes we included. So obviously PFAS is a big deal. And so I'm gonna talk about that. This is a high concern for our bay. We also included two different classes that are often used in plastics and actually a variety of consumer products. So these would be organophosphate esters, OPEs we often say for abbreviation. Um, Tom mentioned these as flame retardants. So many of these are used as flame retardant additives in a whole bunch of products. And then we also looked at bisphenols and the classic one you've all heard of is bisphenol A or BPA, but there's a whole bunch of different bisphenols. We looked at, I believe 16 of them in this study. We also checked out ethoxylated surfactants, which are these kind of detergent-like chemicals. I'm gonna defer comments on that because that's part of a larger study. And then Ezra is actually gonna present some of our tire contaminant data in Zero Talk next. All right, so at the conclusion of the study, we have data on over 240 different individual chemicals. So it's a pretty powerful study, um, a major effort by the RMP. And if you want more highlights, 
that RMP update that we've talked about, the little annual publication, check that out because we have a little write up with some different highlights. Um, so that's kind of a fun little read through you can check out. But meanwhile, I'm just gonna give you a couple high level highlights for a couple of these classes. All right, so PFAS. We just had a big old session on PFAS. It's a major, major priority and we do consider it a high concern in the Bay. Persistent, bioaccumulative, highly toxic class. All right, we see a lot of PFAS in the Bay. Let me walk you through this box whisker plot because there's gonna be another one too. So I want you to um, get a sense of how to interpret it. All right, so each of the rows in this box whisker plot is data on an individual PFAS. So like PFOA or PFOS. The little dots are concentrations in our samples. So um, in total, there's gonna be 25 different dots, actually 21, because this is only the urban samples. And then the box and whisker, that kind of gives you a statistical summary of the dots that you're seeing and the line in the middle of the box, that's the median. Now, one thing in particular to note is that concent that concentration on the X axis, total concentration is a nanogram per liter, and that is a log scale uh, concentration right there. So 10 to the zero is one nanogram per liter, 10 to the one is 10, and 10 to the two is 100 nanogram per liter. So one thing you can see right here, besides that there's a lot of different PFAS present, is those ranges, uh, the scatter of the dots and the width of the box whiskers is quite wide, especially when you think about that log scale. So that's a really interesting thing for us to think about, because it means stormwater concentrations are quite variable. And so if we want to come up with a decent first order load estimate, you know, a mass discharge to the bay, we're going to need to do a little more work to figure out why certain sites have a higher concentration and others might have a lower. So this might be thinking about that upstream watershed, you know, different activities or landscape features that might lead to the higher concentration. And it could also be modified by the storm, like the size or intensity, right? So this is really giving us a clue that um, due to this variability, we're going to need to think carefully about our load estimate and develop more data. All right, here are our top three PFAS when it comes to like the median concentration, the overall median in the middle concentration in our stormwater samples. So you probably remember some of these acronyms from before, perfluorohexanoic acid, that's a C6 chain, carbon, six carbon chain, perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, and perfluorooctane sulfate, sulfonate, PFOS. So now I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna link this to that wastewater talk you just heard. All right, so here we've got the stormwater data, median and concentration compared to the Bakwa municipal wastewater effluent for those three, the top contaminants I just mentioned. So here you can see that the median concentrations are pretty similar. So we know wastewater is an important pathway and now based on this study, we know that urban stormwater is also an important pathway based on those similar concentrations. Now, if you look at the ranges, the numbers in parentheses, that stormwater is really wide in its range compared to wastewater. And that's something we might expect. Um, stormwater is quite variable. We saw it in the box whisker plot and here we're seeing it here. Compared to wastewater, the stormwater is kind of all over the place and really gonna take a little work to, to figure out um, the, what factors are leading to these different concentrations. All right, so that's PFAS. Let's move on to our next two classes. So we've got the organophosphate esters or OPEs, which are often used as flame retardants, but also have a lot of other uses in plastics and various consumer goods. And then we got the bisphenols like bisphenol A, classic use is polycarbonate, you know, that hard plastic, but there's a lot of other uses too. Um, one of the ones we can think about is the thermal receipt paper has BPA or used to, sometimes it's, sometimes it's different now. And actually that's something I wanna highlight in my next slide. But anyway, these two classes are both fairly mobile. So the chemicals are coming off our products. They're getting out in the environment. They do have toxicity concerns 
In particular, endocrine disruption is probably something you've all heard about, uh, especially related to BPA. So this is a these two classes are of concern in our bay. We think of OPEs as high concern and bisphenols as moderate based on our bay water monitoring data. All right, so one thing I mentioned about BPA, some of the switcheroos that we're seeing, this is that concept of regrettable substitution again. So this is a little cartoon from ChemTrust. You can walk through the little panels, but just to indicate that BPA, which is still widely used, um, was in even more products back in the day. Then we discover these endocrine disrupting properties and a couple of products now do not contain BPA for regulatory reasons, or in some cases, just because companies decided to remove it. So you often see those BPA free labels like on a baby bottle. So, okay, that's cool, right? No more BPA, but unfortunately, in some cases, what's going on is the company might replace bisphenol A with a different bisphenol. And those are less well studied bisphenols, but they could have similar toxic effects. So this could be a situation where we've got re regrettable substitution. And that thermal receipt paper that I mentioned, that's one where we do sometimes see BPA uh, being switched out for BPS, as in SAM. All right, so what are we seeing in our urban stormwater? Which bisphenols are we seeing? All right, this is my box whisker plot for BPA, bisphenols, and the OPE. So that very top cluster of three, those are the bisphenols that we observed at high levels in our urban stormwater and at high frequency. So here you can see BPA still widely present. Even though it got kicked out of a couple products, this is still like a dominant high production volume chemical. So we're still using a lot of it in our society. But you can see below it that bisphenol F and S are also present. We are seeing these in our Bay Area watershed, and we can also see them out in Bay water. So this is uh, perhaps a sign that some of this regrettable substitution is happening and maybe some of these bisphenols are ending up well, we know for sure some of these bisphenols are ending up in our stormwater and in our bay. All right, so the rest of these boxes are the organophosphate esters. This is a really broad class. I actually, I'm not even including all the different chemicals we looked at. There were dozens of them. Here are the top three organophosphate esters that we observed most commonly in and at highest concentrations in our samples. And in fact, if you sum these three um, per sample, you're going to see 20 to 80% of the overall OP signal. So these ones are really dominating our, our stormwater numbers. And uh, the, the bottom two, TSEP and TDCIPP, these are chlorinated organophosphate esters that have very common use as flame retardants. So this is really interesting. It is suggesting that some of these flame retardant uses could be uh, percolating from products and getting out into the environment, right? And just as a side note, there is um, some studies and a growing amount of work that indicate that for many products, adding these little additives isn't helping function or reducing health problems in a fire. So we're adding chemicals without, um, without a positive, it's not reducing risks in a fire, and instead it's just contaminating the environment. So not such a great outcome. Oh, and this middle one, TBOEPP, tris 2 butoxyethylphosphate that one has some broader uses um, in all kinds of stuff like uh, paints and varnishes and uh, floor, floor treatments. So just a note that OPEs aren't just used as flame retardants, but they do have broader uses. All right, that's my data so far. My take home message is, is that many CECs that we observed in the study are present in urban stormwater. And in some cases we can show directly that even directly in our region, these concentrations are similar to wastewater. So this is really a pathway to keep an eye on when it comes to emerging contaminants. And I do wanna emphasize for you guys, this is actually fairly recent sort of acknowledgement in the overall scientific community. So RMP is actually at the forefront of the realization that urban stormwater is an important pathway for emerging contaminants to get out to the environment. Uh, my second point is that concentrations are quite variable. 
So again, and I actually didn't emphasize that with the BPA and OPEs, but again, we're going to need to do a little more work to figure out uh, upstream sources and other factors that might lead to higher or lower concentrations at the sampling site, because that's going to inform a robust kind of first order load estimate for our bay so we can figure out um, how important urban stormwater is relative to wastewater. All right. We do see stormwater CECs as a continuing, possibly even growing focus of the RMP. So this screening study was a major effort and we see plenty of more work in this area. So one thing to highlight, and some of these highlights, even more highlights are in the RMP update. One thing to highlight is this remote sampler development that Don Yi is leading. He's creating these contraptions that we can deploy ahead of the storm. And then the, the contraption can grab a composite sample for us, and then we come back and grab it later. Man, this is going to be a game changer in terms of reduce, reducing cost and increasing capacity for sample collection, because we won't have to be out there manually sampling in the dead of night. We're also working, uh, Tom mentioned this briefly, on a, an integrated monitoring and modeling approach, because we see that by combining these two different techniques, we can more quickly and smartly develop the data that's going to need to good, lead to good first order load estimates and help us look upstream and think about sources that might be appropriate for management. All right, and that is my talk. Um, I wanted to highlight some of my colleagues who will be co-authors on an upcoming manuscript, still working on it, um, and then also the leads of many of our analytical labs. This was really quite a cutting edge effort. These are like top guys who are working with us um, to give us this breadth of data and really solid high quality data. Um, I'm very grateful to the whole team. All right, thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the tire derived contaminants in San Francisco Bay. And this is both microplastics and chemical contaminants. Um, so to get us started, we all are aware that tires wear down as we drive because we have to replace them every once in a while. So if you're like me a couple of years ago, you probably didn't really think about that, except of worrying when you had to pay several hundred dollars for new tires. Um, we also in this room generally know that most California stormwater flows directly to surface water without any treatment, meaning that our um, sewer system and our storm drain system are separate, um, which means that the stormwater is not going to a wastewater treatment plant before it's going out into the bay. Um, and this is true in many places, not just the Bay Area, um, but it's something that people often don't think about that the stormwater is not really treated before it is getting into the surface waters. So when you combine those two facts that you may not think about that often together, <laughs> it's maybe not that surprising that our previous comprehensive monitoring of microplastics in San Francisco Bay, um, that was the Moore study that Tom talked about this morning, um, we found average stormwater microplastic concentrations were 100 times greater than wastewater concentrations and tire particles were about half of all of those particles found in stormwater. Um, and using a simple bay model uh, or a simple model of the bay watershed to extrapolate baywide loads, we estimated that over 5 trillion tire particles were entering the bay every year. And this study, we um, were using a filter to capture the microparticles, and that filter was 125 microns. So anything smaller than that was not captured in this study. And many tire wear particles are smaller than that. In fact, um, by uh, mass, most of them are going to be, or by volume, sorry, most of them are going to be smaller than that. And um, so, this is uh, important to think about because this estimate of 5 trillion tire particles 
is kind of an underestimate because it doesn't include all of those littler particles. Um, so my colleague Kelly Moran, who is somewhere in the audience, um, <laughs> Uh, led an effort to estimate how much tire wear is being emitted in the Bay Area and then in the state of California as a whole um, using a couple of different methods. So the first was taking tire wear rates and multiplying them by vehicle distances traveled. And then the second is taking tire sales data and multiplying it by tread mass loss data. Um, and you can see that the numbers agree fairly well considering how simple these calculations are. Um, the first method that's using tire wear rates is probably slightly lower because the tire wear rates that exist um, to be used are from Europe and European cars are different from American cars and that they're generally smaller. And we have a correction factor for that difference, but it may not be sufficient to account for how big our vehicles are. Um, this ends up being uh, about two and a half kilograms of tire wear per person per year. And if you're like me, you may not think about stuff in kilograms very often because we live in the US. That's about the size of my baby when they were born. That's a lot. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, say that this is maybe going to change as we move towards more electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are a lot heavier than their gas counterparts. And that could mean that more tire wear would be produced, but we don't have data to back up that hypothesis. So I can't tell you what it would look like if we were all electric vehicles and whether that number would be a lot higher or not. But that is a big data gap that we are interested in filling. Um, so of all of those, one baby's worth of tire particles per person per year, how much of that actually enters the, um, the surface waters and, and our bay? Um, we used the monitoring data um, plus this, these estimate uh, emissions estimates data and a couple of assumptions to um, calculate the wash off fraction and found that it was about 300 to 800 million kilograms per year, or about two to 6% of total estimated tire emissions are gonna make their way into the bay. And this is, like I said earlier, something we need to think about, not just from the standpoint of the particles themselves, but also all of the chemicals that these particles contain. Um, so there's a growing body of evidence that tire particles are toxic to a wide variety of organisms, but also tire chemicals from these particles. So this is a crazy table and I don't expect you to read all of it. What I want you to focus on, or I guess, so this table is a, a bunch of recent papers studying effects of tire particles on various organisms. You don't have to read the details. What I want you to focus on is that many of these, any of the ones with any of the rows with an X on them is a study where uh, the authors considered the exposures they were using in these toxicity tests to be environmentally relevant, meaning that these are concentrations you would find in the environment. Um, and across these papers, we see a lot of different organisms have been studied. Any of the ones in bold, there were significant effects on those organisms found. Um, these are both freshwater and marine organisms, and many of them are organisms that we find in the bay. Um, and a variety of different endpoints were studied and observed to be affected. So that means different effects on these different kinds of organisms. Um, and uh, this is testing micro particles, which are the larger uh, tire particles, nanoparticles, which you can see are not very well studied, um, and then also leachates, which is when people or the researchers would um, take particles and allow them to leach chemicals out and then remove the particles and just use those chemical leachates. Um, and the effects from the particles versus the leachates are not always the same. And sometimes the leachates are worse, sometimes the particles are worse, sometimes it's much more complicated. Um, so there's still a lot to learn. And this also, this list is just the tire particles and total leachates. It doesn't include any of the many, many studies that are focusing on specific known tire chemicals. Um, 
So tires are very complex chemical mixtures. They're not just rubber. They have lots and lots of things in them. Um, so this is also a not comprehensive list of some of the chemicals of potential environmental concern that are found in tires. Um, and I've put a star next to all of the chemicals that are of interest to the California Department of Toxic Substance Control, DTSC, um, for either they're already regulating them or they're interested in potentially regulating them as part of their safer consumer products program, which I think Jen is gonna talk about more next. Um, and uh, so one you may have heard about <laughs> because it's been in our news a lot the last couple of, of years um, is 6PPD, which is N13-dimethylbutyl and phenyl P phenyl uh, phenylene diamine. 6-PPD, um, it's part of a class of PPD compounds um, that DTSC is especially interested in. And 6-PPD um, just recently was formerly listed by DTSC as a priority, or tires containing 6-PPD, were formerly listed by DTSC as a priority product, which means that tire manufacturers whose products are sold in California are now responsible for finding less toxic alternatives. And that's because this chemical is insanely toxic to coho salmon. Um, so it's not actually the chemical itself. 6-PPD is intentionally added to tires as an anti ozonant um, It protects the rubber in tires from breaking down due to ozone in the air. So without 6-PPD in tires, tires do not last very long at all, like 10,000 miles before they break down. So it's a really important ingredient for extent significantly extending the lifetime of the tire. However, as it's performing this essential function of um, protecting the rubber from breaking down with ozone, um, it's creating a chemical transformation product, 6-PPD quinone. And this chemical is ending up in urban runoff and has been recently implicated as the causative agent for what is called urban runoff mortality syndrome in coho salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so in the Pacific Northwest for years, there it was observed that anytime there was a storm um, and coho salmon were in streams near roads, they would all die. Um, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> we don't like that. So. Um, Finding that this chemical is the cause is really important in terms of understanding and preventing that problem. Um, so the graph on the right is um, from the paper identifying 6-PPD quinone as that causative agent of um, the coho salmon fish kills. And um, you can see that uh, many of the runoff concentrations were actually exceeding the LC50, or the concentration at which 50% of fish die. Um, what is also important to note in this particular graph is that we have San Francisco receiving water um, on the graph. This is actually SFEI data, um, and it's from our urban creeks. And while we are not exceeding the LC50 uh, most of the time, but there are some samples that do, um, we're still approaching it. Um, now, Coho salmon is not particularly relevant to us at this point in time because coho have been extirpated from the bay since the 1980s. Um, but that doesn't mean we should not worry about these concentrations um, because recent work has identified that uh, 6-PPD quinone is also toxic to other related salmonids, including um, rainbow trout, which is genetically the same thing as steelhead. Um, and the bay has both rainbow trout and steelhead. Uh, and in fact, um, our steelhead populations are considered endangered. Um, so of the 54 watersheds that are tributary to the bay, 24 of them still support steelhead or resident rainbow trout. Um, and so the difference is just the rainbow trout are always freshwater, whereas the steelhead move to um, estuarine and then ocean water. Um, before spawning, um, and they come back to spawn. And that migration between fresh and salt water often happens in our same wet season. Um, yeah, so here's the list of tire chemicals that I showed you before. I've added a column for RMP monitoring. This is not necessarily all ongoing monitoring, but it's 
chemicals that we are either currently monitoring or have monitored for in the past. And you can see that we actually cover this list pretty well. Um, so uh, I don't have time to talk about all of these, obviously. So I'm going to focus on 6-PPD quinone and then a couple of other tire related contaminants that we've been measuring recently. Um, DPG, which is uh, diphenylguanidine. Um, it's an accelerator used in rubber vulcanization during making of the tires. And then hexamethoxymethylmelamine or HMMM or HMM, <laughs> um, which <laughs> hmm, is a cross-linking agent that is used in tires. Um, so the um, data that I'm going to talk about are um, from an ongoing monitoring project that is um, sort of piggybacking on the status and trends wet season um, pilot that is ongoing that Tom mentioned earlier. Um, so we have two years worth of data and we're planning on sampling again this coming wet season. So I'm showing you an in progress project. Um, so this pro the monitoring design for this project, we have um, urban stormwater sites around the bay. Um, and then we also have, like Becky talked about, a couple of what we call reference sites that are less urban. Um, and then in addition to those stormwater sites, we're also sampling at the margins of the bay, so near um, the edges of the bay where stormwater is coming into the bay. Um, and then in the open bay, both during the dry season and then also a couple of tidal cycles after the wet season. Um, and our simple hypothesis is that we're going to see uh, decreasing concentrations as you move from upstream in the watershed down into the bay because of dilution. And that is, in fact, exactly what you see. So um, I'm going to show you DPG and HMM first and then move back to 6-PPD quinone. Um, so these graphs are color coded to go with the sampling map that I just showed you. So on the far left is the open bay during the dry season. You can see those concentrations are really low, which is expected. Um, then next to that is our um, reference or less urban reference stormwater sites. And you can see those are slightly higher than the bay, but still pretty low. Unfortunately, our less urban reference sites still have roads and highways and things in them. and um, at least one of those sites is unfortunately kind of close to a road, so I think it's more impacted than would be ideal. Um, next to that is our urban stormwater sites, which you see are much higher concentrations, and then the near field bay sites, the margin sites, are higher than in the center of the bay, um, but lower than the stormwater uh, by itself. And then what is interesting on these, I think at least, is that the open bay sites, when they're sampled a couple of tidal cycles after a storm, are higher concentrations than during the dry season. So the dilution by itself is not completely um, putting those concentrations back at dry season levels. OK, so 6-PPD quinone shows the same trend. Um, the concentrations now on the y-axis you can see are a lot lower, but this compound is so ding dang toxic that that is still something to think about. Um, all of the non-detects are below the uh, method detection limit of 2.5 nanograms per liter, um, but we see the same general pattern. How does this compare with toxicity? I already told you our um, Stormwater concentrations are in the coho LC50 range, so that's not surprising. Um, for a more bay relevant species, the um, rainbow trout LC50 is above all of these concentrations, which is great. But an LC50 is not a very protective threshold because killing half the fish is like <laughs> ecological disaster. Um, so I've calculated an interim PNAC, um, predicted no effect concentration based on this acute data. We don't have any kind of sublethal toxicity testing data yet. So I don't, I can't tell you what kinds of sublethal effects that may also affect populations over time may occur. Um, but my interim PNAC is uh, below the stormwater level uh, concentrations, but still a little bit above some of the, or a little bit. The margin sites uh, are still uh, potentially at that level. So that is 
sort of concerning. Um, I also want to say that this is there's a lot of uncertainty um, in terms of salinity and how smultification uh, affects toxicity. Um, to stormwater is a complex mixture of contaminants, so thinking about one single contaminant versus the complex mixture, how that may change toxicity that these organisms are experiencing. And um, we have very little data on other organisms and their uh, and, and these compounds effects on them. Um, I also want to mention that stormwater is kind of a complicated system and that it's repeat pulses, um, which is very different from our toxicity testing regime that we're normally using. So toxicity depends on concentration. It also depends on the exposure length. And most of our toxicity testing is either one high dose for a short amount of time or one lower dose for an extended period of time. But Stormwater is neither of those. <laughs> it's instead pulses of a higher dose, maybe interspersed with a lower dose or nothing, uh, or like below detection limits. Um, so it's hard to compare our toxicity information with our stormwater data. Um, and we also, and I have no time left, but I'm so close to done. Um, we also don't understand that much about the mechanism of action of 6-PPD quinone. So we don't actually know what is happening within the fish to cause these effects. We know some, but not the full mechanism of action. And we don't know how it's being taken in or excreted or metabolized. And that also can make it really difficult to make predictions about um, what kinds of uh, effects we might encounter. So in conclusion, there's a lot of microplastics going into the bay from tires. Um, that is leading to detectable concentrations of a lot of different tire derived contaminants, um, even in the center of the bay, even with dilution from mixing, not just in the stormwater itself. Um, 6 PPD quinone is really toxic to coho, but it also may be of concern for a local steelhead and rainbow trout in the bay. Um, but we need more data to be able to say more about that. Um, we have several different tires, fact sheets, and uh, reports that are available for you to read. And this in project, in progress project, will have a report eventually, but we still have more sampling to do before then. Um, and I am way out of time, so I'm going <laughs> to step away from the microphone now. Hi, everybody. So I'm Jen Jackson. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I've only been with DTSC for two months. So they said, hey, get the new girl to come out here and tell, them, <laughs> tell the story. I'm going a little rogue. I'm, I'm not just going to focus on stormwater. I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly about our program. And my two goals are to give you a sense of some of the the candidate chemicals that we're working on, products that we're working on, but also to walk you through our process, how we regulate products um, so that maybe you can help us uh, and so you'll see how. So uh, to give you a sense of our North Star, um, we our, our mission at SEP is to advance the design, development and use of consumer products that are chemically safer for people and the environment. And under that, we have a number of different goals. So we want to reduce hazardous chemicals in the products. We want to increase adoption of safer alternatives and innovation so that we have safer products. And we want to re reduce regrettable substitutes. So as Becky had mentioned earlier, we don't want these drop in replacement chemicals that are potentially just as bad to be dropped into those products when we regulate the other chemicals. And I'll talk a little bit about how we try to do that. So we have a, a regulatory framework and the way our regs work, they're kind of in four phases. And so I'm gonna walk you through the phases and we have a lot of things going on in lots of different phases. And I'm just gonna show you a, a crazy Tableau Gantt chart. This is just one portion of what's going on. There's another couple slides further. Um, this is just beauty beauty and personal care products. We have a lot of different initiatives that happen that the public may not ever really see, but are, that are happening in the background. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those. But 
the upshot is we're very busy. And I'm part of the doubling, almost doubling of the staff size of the Safer Consumer Products Program. Um, we just hired a number of environmental scientists and um, we're going to be hiring some more supervisors, so keep your eyes open. So that first phase is the candidate chemicals list. And so we cannot regulate a product chemical combination unless a chemical is on what's called the candidate chemical list. And that's brought to us by a number of different lists. So we have a, a list of lists. I think there are 23 or 24 different authoritative bodies that have lists like Prop 65, the Inter, uh, International Agency on Research for Cancer. Many other countries have lists of chemicals of concern. Those all are on our list. And then we can also bring chemicals to that list and propose them and then um, have rulemaking to add them to the list. So we have two that are currently in play um, that are potentials. Sorry, the formatting is a little funky. Um, so the first is PPDs. So you saw an Ezra slide that we're doing a lot on six PPD, but actually there should have been a little star next to PPDs because we're concerned that as tire manufacturers start to think about what are we going to do to get rid of six PPD that other PPDs are structurally similar, may provide the same function, and they would just drop that in. They might do that, but if we have all of the PPDs on our candidate chemical list, then we could regulate them on those too in the future. So this is a class-based approach to try to reduce that regrettable substitution. And then um, just in terms of timeline, so on November 1st, we are going to have a, a workshop on this so that we can um, basically eventually put this into our candidate chemical list. Um, and we released a full technical document on PPDs last week. So check out our website and I have links to that at the end. The other future potential candidate chemical is microplastics. And um, the way we define chemicals is fairly broad. <laughs> so microplastics can, can, can be a candidate chemical. And um, we released in May a background document on this. We are currently in the process of writing up a candidate chemical profile, which will probably be released um, in early 2024. Uh, and basically what that means is once this is on the candidate chemical list, we can regulate product chemical combinations. So products that either contain microplastics as an additive, like facial scrubs and things like that, or that degrade into microplastics. So maybe food packaging or tires. So the next phase of our regulatory process is this product chemical combination. So we identify a priority product and um, we have a number of things that happen kind of around that phase. So we, um, I'll just back up actually really quickly. So in this phase, we are basically naming products that have the potential to expose biota, humans, to a contaminant or a chemical of concern, and they have the potential to have widespread adverse impacts. That's a pretty broad authority, which is really good. That means that we can be proactive. We don't have to have the smoking gun. We can work ahead, hopefully, of um, real problems in the future. So um, one place that we are working on is um, something that came to us from the wastewater or stormwater community, California Association of Stormwater Quality Agencies, petitioned DTSC to regulate zinc in motor vehicle tires. This is a, zinc is used as a vulcanizer or in the vulcanization process is a very, very old photo of vulcanization. <laughs> um, but basically zinc is a problem and y'all said, hey, we need to work on this. It came to us quite a while ago. Um, we've been working on it. We uh, have completed our peer review and plan to release the notice of proposed action mid-year next year, maybe even early um, 2024. The reason why it wasn't sooner though is because 6PPD came up. And so we've been working actively on 6PPD. And as Ezra mentioned, the LC50 is super duper low. And that is, that is a smoking gun that we really wanted to work on quickly. But you'll be seeing this very soon. We also do a lot of screening initiatives in this phase. So we have to figure out what product chemical combinations we're going to work on. And so that there's a 
really big world out there of a lot of different products and a lot of different chemicals. And so um, these are future, I'm giving you a little bit of a preview. So um, I think it was Becky mentioned artificial turf. So we're looking at artificial turf and what are all the different chemicals of concern potentially that we might wanna regulate. Um, and so that could be microplastics, PFAS, um, number of other chemicals. And so um, this screening initiative is looking at multiple chemicals, one product, and then eventually the hope is that we can do more than just one product chemical combination, that we can do one product plus multiple chemicals in the future. Um, and so this, uh, we're, we're doing a systematic review, um, I'm sorry, we're doing a screening document right now, and that should be coming out very early of 2024. We're also doing similar kind of work on 1,4-dioxane and cleaning products and personal care products. So 1,4-dioxane, for those of you in the wastewater world, know this is a, a problematic chemical. Y'all are regulated on that. And um, it's a common contaminant of these kinds of products in the ethoxylation process for making the products. Um, so we are about to release a technical report that would support priority product rulemaking. And at the end of this year, you'll, you should be seeing that report. And then rulemaking would happen subsequent to that. Another screening initiative is quaternary ammonium compounds in cleaning and personal care products again. Um, so similarly, we're, we're wanting to have all of these quacks and multiple different products and have rulemakings that would potentially address multiple products at once. Um, and we're currently conducting a systematic review of quacks in these different kinds of products, and that should be coming out in quarter one, 2024. So the next phase, the alternatives analysis. So what happens when we tell a manufacturer, we're regulating you, we've named this priority product or this product chemical combination. So a manufacturer then is alerted that, oh, you're going to be re regulated. What do they have to do? So um, an example of, of a product that's in this phase right now is uh, 6 PPD in motor vehicle tires. You've heard a lot about it. And again, it's 6 PPD is really important. Um, it helps keep tires together instead of shedding lots of microplastics faster. Um, and it is highly toxic. So. I want to make sure that y'all understand that our program does not ban 6PPD. It says to the manufacturers, we want you to do an alternatives analysis to see if there's something else that you could use, or maybe you don't need it at all. And I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so we create re regulations, which we just did with um, 6PPD and tires that came out on October 1st, as Ezra mentioned. And what that says to manufacturers is you have to notify us if you bring tires with 6PPD into the stream of commerce in California. They tell us that and then they have uh, about six months to put together a preliminary alternatives analysis. So that will be due in May of next year. Or they could say, we're just gonna remove the chemical, we don't need it. We know that's not true for tires, but that has been true for other products. So for example, we regulated flame retardants in nap mats Manufacturers said we don't need flame retardants in children's nap mats, and they took them out, they were done. They could say we're going to replace 6PPD with some other chemical. So the third thing there, the blue box, that's why we want to regulate or add PPDs in general to the candidate chemical list, because then we could quickly regulate those if we needed to. Or they could just say we're not going to sell our product in California, and that has happened too. So with methylene chloride and paint strippers, we regulated that and the manufacturer said, okay, we won't sell in California. Some of them got rid of it completely, but some of them are still selling it in other states. So not always, not always a win, but a partial win. So um, the next phase is our regulatory response phase. So let's say a manufacturer says, I cannot find some other thing to put in my tire or whatever. What do I do then? So we ask them to mitigate the harm. So that might look like for tires, can we figure out how that wear pattern is slowed down? Um, the next chem uh, chemical that I'm gonna show you is not at all a water quality issue, but it's the only product chemical combination that we have in this phase. So that's why I'm showing it. Um, this is MDI, which is methylene diphenyl 
diisocyanates, um, which is basically a really harmful chemical to worker health and safety. It causes asthma in people who, either DIYers or people who work in the commercial sector doing spray foam insulation like this. So it's, it can be acute, it's pretty harmful to people. And so we've regulated this, they said in their alternatives assessment, we don't have an alternative. So now we're telling them that you're going to have to inform consumers, so reducing harm. You're going to fund innovation, so we're going to require them to provide grants to innovators to find some other alternative. And then we also have a training requirement for commercial operators so that, that a commercial person who's deploying the spray foam will know that they need to wear a PPE to protect themselves. So that's the kind of thing that we can require in this regulatory response phase. So that is the, the high level of where we are with a number of different product chemical combinations and also candidate chemicals. I want to invite you to get involved. So just like with the petition from Casca on zinc and tires, we would like to hear from you. And we I have been here listening about chemicals that are concerning to the bay, to um, our biota, and we need more of that information so that we can move ahead and try to regulate more product chemical combinations. And like I said, we're almost doubling in size, which means we're expanding our capacity to do more of that. Um, we have a, I have a few uh, different links and things like that. So when you get the slides later, you can click on, get on our list. So for all of these workshops and uh, public comment periods, you can hear about them by getting on our email list. Um, thank you very much. I think I'm good with time. Okay, great. Thank you all. Wonderful talks. I invite you to come up and have a seat. Stay away from the microphones. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a. We found a laptop. We won't tell you what kind of laptop. Um, we, found it charging upstairs. we found it charging upstairs. So if anybody is missing a laptop, come see this person. Okay. Um, any questions? It's a, it was a great panel. Uh, kept me awake after lunch. It's, it's a struggle. Um, I, no, kudos to all three of you. I, I have a question for Becky. We are engaged in a, in a process of trying to deal with our housing issues, and, and, and that's a, a good thing, but I've got some concerns about whether or not it's running counter to what we need to do to, to, for green infrastructure. Um, so so this, is, this is a question of what do we know, what should we know, and uh, so what does densification of residential development do to our urban runoff problems. And, and I have a couple thoughts here. First, there's a loss of pervious areas uh, that may accelerate runoff and, get, and reduce what level of treatment you get on the landscape. On the other hand, denser development may reduce outdoor activities that generate contaminants, at least on a per person basis. And then having first served on the SFEI board with Luna Leopold, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize that at some point a watershed has so much impervious uh, area that it's not going to change much with a little more. Um, it, it can't get much worse. So should we, what, what should we be thinking about to try to make sure we're not with the densification hamstringing our ability to manage urban runoff? And that's for Becky because I know she can answer it. <laughs> Use this one if you want. Yeah, maybe this is the easiest. <laughs> That's a great question. I wish Alicia Gilbreth was up here with us uh, to walk through. She's our real green stormwater infrastructure expert. I actually am more on the source control side of management. So I like to kick all the bad chemicals out of the products which would then reduce the potential even higher up uh, in the kind of the, the chemical transport uh, to the bay. So if you think about source control, that, uh, and by that source control, what I mean is removing 
chemical concern from the products. This mic is a little funny. Uh, and very similar to, well, that is the goal of Jen Jackson's program, right? So that's how I think about developing data and the best way to use the data. In many cases, green stormwater infrastructure is useful for um, filtering, um, but some of our contaminants are persistent and not really, they're persistent, they're in some cases water soluble, and so they're really readily transported to the bay. And so that's why I'm not really sure green stormwater infrastructure is a silver bullet that we can use uh, for addressing so many chemical contaminants in our environment. Any other comments on that question? Question for Jen. First, I just wanted to say I appreciated what observing the program mature and 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 now staffed up with solid solid successes. I, we're going to look forward to more better efforts and, uh, and I appreciate how we at the water boards and we as part of the RMP have a can be a key partner to help you so it, it's great to have that mechanism but but you didn't touch on this and I and maybe you can pass on if you don't have the answer but what do you do about enforcement because like even if even in a situation where you can say they, they said we're not going to sell it in California you can still buy products from around the world through the web and da, 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 da. so just just briefly say how, how do we make sure things get done once you have the regulatory action lucky you that is a uh, part of my purview <laughs> and i guess it it kind of fits within both the alternatives analysis and the regulatory response phases and it's really ultimately its own phase but um so if a manufacturer, for example, doesn't actually give us a priority product notification saying, I introduce this into California and they do, then we can, we can enforce against them then. Um, we, we imagine with say six PPD and tires that pretty much everybody uses six PPD and tires. There's one manufacturer that we know of in Germany that may not, but otherwise they all should be sending us a PPN. If they don't, then we have the ability to enforce. And um, I don't know what the numbers are, but there's you know thousands of dollars per day kinds of, of fines and penalties. Um, but then later on, let's say somebody says, "Okay, I got it out of my product," then we can we are doing product testing. So we do product testing early on in that screening phase to see where is there a problem with a chemical product combination. But later on, too, after we've regulated it, we we do testing. So we're currently doing um, testing for carpets and rugs and um, PFAS and treatment, uh, like spray treatments for stain guards, et cetera. So um, we will likely very soon be doing some enforcement. The good news on that is that very few of the carpets and rugs actually have levels of PFAS over 100 ppm that we've, at least those that we've tested. So that's really good news. Manufacturers have largely gotten out of using PFAS at those higher levels. Um, and I don't have data on treatments, but that is that is part of what we'll be doing. And we just haven't really gotten there because we're 10 years in. So Simona is working on an amazing accomplishments report and video. So I stay tuned for this really cool video that we just got to see yesterday. Um, but essentially, we haven't gotten to that phase so much of our process because it's still a fairly new law. Um, but here we are. We're we're getting there. So you'll see more. Great presentations, everybody. And uh, Jen, great job. It's so great to have you in the program. Um, I just wanted to quickly add, so Jen mentioned we have a workshop for PPD derivatives, adding them to our candy chemicals list on November 1st, but we also currently have a public comment period that's open through November 15th. So if you have information that can help us or recommendations for what we should do, um, you can submit comments through CalSAFER. And yes, as Jen said, we are 10 years old, we are going to have a campaign, um, and as part of that, we will also request your reflections and ideas for what we can do in the future, so I hope when the campaign rolls out that you join and uh, yeah, keep engaging with us. Thank you.
to follow up on uh, Tom's question and Jan's response, um, can we use some of those thousands of dollars per day for studies, or where would that money go? It's a great question. I don't know the answer to it, but I imagine that it will continue to fund additional work. Maybe Simona, do you know what happens with fines? We've never done this. <laughs> so we'll find out. Let us know what your thoughts are. <laughs> Maybe supplemental environmental pro projects, grants, innovation, um, probably for innovation too, I would suspect. Do you ever consider alternative uses for products like with tires they are reused a lot for kids playgrounds, which seems maybe not the safest. <laughs> so tires is a it's a really big problem because we generate millions and millions and millions of waste tires every year and so Cal recycle has had many incentive programs for reusing tire crumb rubber in lots of different ways because otherwise we just fill up our landfills with it. Um, so it is a real challenge now that we know that there are a lot of harmful chemicals. There's a little bit of a point of tension and we are working across other with other agencies on this, um, you know, do, should we really be incentivizing the use of, of crumb rubber in artificial turf fields, for example. Um, these are really big challenging questions because then what do you do with them instead? Um, if you have good answers, please let us know. <laughs> um, as part of the Safer Consumer Products program, is there any component that would require um, manufacturers to identify the risks of a chemical before they put it out for use? Unfortunately, our regs really don't get at that. Um, I mean, the hope is that what we we put out a priority product work plan or a what is it called? Our work plan. Um, every we are required to do it by law every three years. So we're about to issue one that will go live for 2024. Um, and so the hope is it's pretty broad. We don't say this product, this chemical, and we're done. We kind of say generally personal care products, generally maybe PFAS or quacks. And so hopefully it sends a signal so that manufacturers who are already producing products with maybe those chemicals might start to think about reformulation early. Um, but we are unlike REACH, which you know is the European law, we don't really have a, a way to require at the chemical level before it becomes gets into a product to really regulate them. So talk to your legislators. <laughs> I, had a, I had a question for you, but I wanted to respond to the first gentleman talked about building housing for affordable housing. And uh, that, that may create problems of more, uh, but people living on the streets also generate uh, chemicals and other things that go into the uh, sewer system and other areas. So uh, having a housing maybe would be more, uh, one would be able to regulate those uh, flow into the environment rather than people living on the street. That was one of the thoughts. And I had, a, you mentioned that um, regarding uh, trying to get chemicals off of the thing, off of uh, uh, manufacturing, you have, one thing said, you said that you have to uh, either man, they have to list the chemical, they, and then, or they have to give money to find alternative. So uh, there are a lot of companies who uh, try to generate organic material, uh, organic products, and they're, but, uh, their usage is not that much because though they tend to be more expensive, I guess it takes them money to come up with this chemical uh, things. So can, is it possible for you to uh, give out funding to people that they can find, uh, try to find pro um, products that have least amount of synthetic chemicals 
and that would be an incentive for you know developing a business or something that may help rather than people trying to do it on their own and then people not being able to buy it because those products are expensive because a lot of the organic products are highly expensive and people just cannot afford to have it so you could start with a thing for people trying to develop this product yeah so i think sort of to encapsulate what you said for the people on zoom um you would like to see that the funds that we have or that manufacturers are funding sort of this new innovation so that we can bring it to scale so these safer products are just not niche they're they're, they're actually widespread more available and less costly is that right that is our hope so we're at this point with the spray foam installation where um, we will be asking for a certain amount of money from the manufacturers to fund grants and the hope is those grants will not just go back to those same manufacturers but to innovators to folks who might think outside of the box that the manufacturer might put over themselves <laughs> um, and so that that is the hope we're we're this is the first time we're getting to do this where we're actually requiring manufacturer to do this so we will see how it plays out we may need to actually adjust our regulations to push the innovation in that direction um but we'll see we'll see we're hopeful that the manufacturers will want to play ball and find other alternatives the real challenge is they might fund something that puts them out of business so we have to work with them figure out how we can do this for everybody feels like they're getting something out of it. Yeah, because like one friend even mentioned that they got rid of, but I think one of our students, they put BPA, they got rid of, but then they introduced a whole bunch of BPs in there. So, you know, the time it takes to figure out uh, whether a chemical is in fact toxic to the environment or to people, it takes time. But so if one could manufacture chemicals with the, uh, things with the least amount of synthetic chemicals, that would be stop us from unnecessarily funding more to try to figure out and also introduce things that are more environmentally safe. Yeah, Andrew. I don't know if this is on or not. No, no it is. Yeah, turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's going to, program's relatively new, right? Um, so I, it will be interesting to see what incentives the program gives to manufacturers in the future. If they know you're there and they know there's enforcement and oversight happening, you would assume the incentive would be to do some work up front, right? To not put chemicals into products that potentially are gonna be problematic. Um, that would be the hope I would assume. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Becky, I have, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned the, um, and we have a couple more minutes, but um, the remote samplers. So remote samplers have been used for a long time, ISCO samplers and stormwater monitoring. This might be a question for Don too. Um, is, you know, kind of what makes these new samplers that we're going to be using so much different than the big ISCO samplers that we've used in, in the past? Um, so, yeah, you already hinted at that. Essentially, they're not big, they're small. So think of it sort of like these hit squads. You, you jump in and you jump out rather than building a big permanent base that you're going to leave in place for years. Um, there are different situations where you'd want one versus the other. But I think these kind of give us more flexibility to go places where we wouldn't otherwise be able to or want to do kind of these long-term setups, right? Great, any other questions? Yeah. You wanna take it? Hey, just by the way, have you guys noticed, Martin has been like in every photo. <laughs> so how about a big hand for Martin? <laughs> and he also helped coordinate a few of these um, sessions as well, so. Uh, my question is for Ezra. Um, I, I know that you mentioned in your talk this like wash off factor of a mass that ends up, you know, actually in the bay versus what's um, emitted. And that number was a lot lower than I, I had expected initially, at least for six PPDQ. Um, so with the rest of it ending up in soils or other sinks, do you expect that to come out eventually? Or are we being exposed to it? And 
put in danger that way? So, yeah, it is a lot lower. Um, a lot of the uh, tire particles end up falling into soils where they're not going to wash off easily. We don't have a lot of toxicity data for how these compounds might affect soil organisms or other terrestrial organisms. So that's like a big mystery still. Um, and I that is also true in many ways of human health impacts. So there, 6-PPD quinone is not the only toxic thing from tires. Um, so we do know things like PAHs, heavy metals also come from tires and those have wide variety of toxic effects. So for those, that could be definitely a, a concern. Um, I know that one thing that people are now thinking about is um, tire particles ending up in agricultural spaces and what, what if the agricultural, the plants are taking up these compounds, then we're being exposed to them. That's actually related to what I did for my uh, PhD, so I'm interested in it. Um, in terms of these newer chemicals that we're thinking about, like 6-PPD, we really have very, very little information about how they may affect humans, but we do know that humans are exposed to them. So a couple of biomonitoring studies have shown that um, people uh, have 6-PPD quinone in their urine, which indicates that we're being exposed, which we know already because um, if you have thought about air quality, PM 2.5 is the um, particles that are small enough to get deep into our lungs and cause various toxic problems, like increased asthma, etc. cetera. Um, and PM 2.5 is partially tire particles. So we, it, it's not surprising to me that we are being exposed to this chemical. I, we don't know how it may affect us. It's not affecting us the same way it affects salmon, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't know. Okay. We're going to, did you want a question or you want to tell us where we're going afterwards? No, no, you can, you can. Just give me a quick answer. This is for both Becky and Ezra. Uh, so we know we have a lot of candidates on our possible concern list. So if, what would, if you had a choice today, what one or two of those should we be putting more attention to? Oh, here, you need the mic. Sorry. Here you go. Like overall? Or I just pick reason a lot. A lot of them are on the possible concern list because we don't have available thresholds. But you have intuition, and we also have some understanding about magnitude of use and so which ones we put attention to possibly one way or another. Just want to give the audience a sense that we are paying attention to those as well. And yeah. So. As you mentioned, a lot of the possible concern compounds are on there because we don't have toxicity information. So if we had more information in the bay, that wouldn't necessarily help us very much. Um, others are there because we don't have good detection methods in the bay, but we might know that they are more toxic. So I, if we had better chemistry for them, then that would be helpful to have. And then there are some that we have toxicity information for and methods for, we just haven't had the time or resources to measure them yet. And so I would maybe think about those as the first priority. I just wanted to give a shout out to Jen Jackson's mention of the quaternary ammonium compounds because we are developing those data now. We're working with Bill Arnold at University of Minnesota and he's one of our expert advisors. So we've got the in. He got a big NSF grant to study these compounds in part because uh, one of their functions is antimicrobial. So there have been a lot more increased use thanks to COVID and all these other things we're dealing with. So uh, this is a, a topic area that the RMP moved really quickly on. As soon as COVID hit, there was like a special study proposal. And so we're really excited to get those data. We've seen a few previews, but we're gonna get more data from Bill Arnold and then we'll be able to figure out, right now it's impossible concern, but we'll be able to figure out where it belongs in our tiered risk-based framework. 
Okay, so one more round of applause for our group. Thanks. So that's wrapping us up. Um, we are convening, if you'd like, to uh, Jupiter, which is right down the street, um, as we do each year. So we welcome you to come there and, and join us. Do you want to say anything before I bring it up? Amy? OK. OK. Thank you all for a good meeting. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>